الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من وله. Good to see you again, uh, dear brothers and our sisters, of course, who are in attendance. الحمد لله we have سبحان الله about a uh, a third of the month of Ramadan that has elapsed already. And I trust that each and every one of you is making every opportunity of every hour that this treasure of a month offers. Imam Ibn Jawzi, he said that, Tallahi, I swear by Allah that if the inhabitants of the graveyards had an opportunity to come back to earth and to make one final wish, that wish would be to experience another day of Ramadan. So may Allah Jalla Jalaluhu inspire us with the ability and the tawfiq to make the best use of this month and to not make us amongst those who regret its departure. But we want to make Eid, this Eid, Eid worth celebrating, having felt inside that this Ramadan was an accomplished one, an accomplished one, whilst also feeling that we could have done better. On that topic of accomplishment, this is a good segue to move into lecture number two for our series, this Ramadan, that we've titled the Life Series. That is comprised of four lectures. The first, which was last week, The Gangster Life. Moving on to this week's lecture, which is The Empowered Life. Next week's lecture will be The Goodly Life. And then finally, it will be The Final Life. Last week's lecture was, to a large extent, quite dark. Parts of it were grim, other parts of it perhaps were a little bit harsh. And if you remember, the last heading that we covered was the way forward. What next? And this is a question I'm asking you, my dear brothers and my sisters. What next? Whether you are a person or were a person who ascribed to this thug life, or whether you were, like the majority of us, a normal Muslim, but perhaps a little bit too normal. And you feel that your life has been, by and large, characterized by lowly, mundane, petty, day-to-day -day routine-like behavior. And you want to do more with your life. The limbs, the senses, the kidneys, the organs, the strengths, that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has given you are clearly there to fulfill a higher purpose. He wouldn't have given you all of these tools and these sophisticated apparatus for you to just live to work and work to live and just to live for another day. Impossible, there must be more. So what is it about the accomplished life, the empowered life? I say to you this, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, if there is an enemy in your life that is on your back, I say to you, place your reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then fulfill the 1000th principle. If you want to succeed at work or you want to succeed in your studies, place your reliance upon Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and then apply the 1000th principle. If you want to move out from the confines of misery to happiness and laziness to proactivity and a meaningless life to a life of meaning and value and achievement, I say to you, place your reliance upon Allah and apply the 1000th principle. So now the question that maybe you are looking to ask, what is the 1000th principle? There was a academic in the field of leadership studies, his name is Kop Kop Maya. And he authored four books on the topic of success. And each one of those books has within it 250 principles of success that he's compiled throughout his life as an expert through coaching experiences, through study, through personal experience. A thousand principles for success divided over four books. Then he was once asked a question during an interview. Which one of these principles in your estimation is the most important? 
and he gave a very crystal clear answer. He said, all of the 999 principles that I have included are absolutely useless if this one principle is not present in your life. It's the principle that says, do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. Take note of this, please. Do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. Now, shelve that thought in your mind for just a moment, and I want to zoom back with you 1400 years to an event that took place just after the Battle of Uhud. News was conveyed to the Prophet والسلام, that there was a man by the name of Khalid ibn Sufyan al Hudali who was gathering the Arab pagan forces to create a coalition to bring them to the city of Medina and put an end to the Muslim presence once and for all. Khalid ibn Sufyan al Hudali. And our Prophet وسلم, in his bid to avoid the bloodshed of war and to minimize casualties, he wanted to neutralize this threat. And how can this be achieved? This is by exterminating this man who was gathering the forces. So the Messenger وسلم, calls a man called Abdullah ibn Unais, a Sahabi, a noble Sahabi, and he gave him very simple, short yet clear instructions. He said, Ya Abdullah, O oh Abdullah, بَلَغَنِي أَنَّ خَالِدًا يَجْمَعُ النَّاسَ لِيَغْزُوَنِي News has been conveyed to me that Khalid is gathering the people to invade Medina. وَهُوَ الْآنَ بِنَخْلَ أَوْ بِعُرَنَ And at this very second, Khalid is found in a place called Nakhla or a place called Urana. فَذْهَبْ إِلَيْهِ فَاقْتُلْهُ So make your way to him and kill him. Abdullah ibn Unais, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنْعَتْهُ لِيَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ حَتَّى أَعْرِفَهُ Messenger of Allah, please describe him to me so I recognize him when I see him. He said to him, آيَةٌ مَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ أَنَّكَ إِذَا رَأَيْتَهُ وَجَدْتَ لَهُ قُشَعْرِيرًا the sign for you to recognize him is that the moment you see him, you're going to feel a shiva going down your body. He said, so I made my way to Nakhla or Urana, where this man was based. And this was around the time of Asr. And then I saw him. And the moment my eyes fell upon him, I felt a huge shiva covering my body, so I knew he was the target. And I feared that I was going to miss my Asr Salah because of what I was doing. But the opportunity was there. So I started to pray my Asr Salah as I was walking, moving my head up and down, gesturing for bowing and prostration, ruku and sujood. Till when the time was right, and I was near Khalid ibn Sufyan, and he was with his wives. He was taking them to their homes. I pounced at Khalid and he was on the ground bleeding and breathing his last. And his wives were all around him sobbing and weeping. So I came back to Medina and the moment the Prophet وسلم, saw me, he said, Aflah al -wajh. This is a face that brings with it success. I said, قَدْ قَتَلْتُهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I killed him, O Messenger of Allah. He said to me, صَدَقْتْ You speak the truth. You did. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave Abdullah ibn Unais a stick. He gave him a stick. And he said, أَمْسِكْ يَا عَبْدَ اللَّهِ هَذِهِ عِنْدَ Keep the stick with you, O Abdullah. He didn't ask him why or what is the stick for. So he kept it with him. The very next day, Abdullah ibn Unais is walking around the city of Medina, carrying out his day-to-day -day duties, and he has his stick in his hand. So people, they say to him, what is the stick? He said, I don't really know. The Prophet ﷺ gave it to me, and he said, keep it with you. They said, didn't you think about asking him what the stick is for? He said, I will ask him. 
So he went to him and he said, Messenger of Allah, what is the stick for? He said to him, Ayatun ma bayni wa baynaka yawm al qiyamati inna aqalla al nasi al mutakhassiruna yawm idh. He said, This stick will serve as a sign to help me recognize you on the day of judgment. And the majority of people will not have sticks to lean on on the day of reckoning. So it's something for the Prophet ﷺ to recognize Abdullah ibn Unais and perhaps give him the treatment he deserves on that day. Subhanallah. Now, I don't want to focus on the actual details of this account and the background story behind it. I want to take from it a completely different lesson that for me is a blindingly obvious one. And I have asked this question to so many of the brothers when I hear, when I relate this story to them, what do you take from this story? No one shares this one. For me, what is the most profound element of this whole encounter is what? How little the conversation was and how significant and enormous the outcomes were. The kalam, the speech was so little. The instructions were basic. And there was no objection. He did what he should do at the time that he should have done it, whether he felt like it or not. There was no kalam, no conversation. Khalid is gathering the people to invade Medina. This is going to cause bloodshed. So go and neutralize him. His description, Messenger of Allah, Shiva. That's it. He comes back. I've killed him, O Messenger of Allah. Yes, you certainly did. End of conversation. He gives him a stick. What is it for? He doesn't ask. So this is a key lesson. That the more you find yourself speaking, talking, usually the fewer your actions will be. Do what you should do, whether you feel like it or not. When you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. With this introduction, dear brothers and sisters, I want to share with you now five principles for those of you who want to lead an empowered life. What is the empowered life? A life of proactivity, a life of vision setting, a life of meeting Allah, and you are confident to say, I carried out my function as a Muslim human being in the life of dunya, the empowered life. Five principles. If you feel that your life is characterized by laziness or too much sleep, too much socializing, moving from one room to the other room in your house, looking for someone to talk to, looking for something to do, looking for something on social media to consume, and you're not really achieving what you feel you could be achieving as a Muslim, you're not a person of growth, I share with you five very simple principles. Please take out your phones. I recommend you to take out your phones Take note of these five headings, and then when you're finished, put them in a place in your life when you can see them. And I promise you, you will begin to see changes in your life, and you will see results. What are these five principles? Principle number one, put an end to excuses. No more justifications. People are very creative, la ilaha illallah. When it comes to giving themselves excuses to wiggle out of difficult situations and to prove to people why they were inactive and why they haven't sacrificed, why they haven't attended, why they haven't learned, why they haven't planned. Very creative, la ilaha illallah, when it comes to creating excuses. But you know, we have a saying in the English language, they call it a an idiom that you can't have the bun and eat it. Or you can't have your cake and eat it. And you can't have the penny and the bun. Meaning it's one or the other. You can't have both. You sacrifice one, you get the other, but the other will go if the, the other one stays. You can't have both. And similarly, I say to you, my dear brother, my dear sister, it is impossible for you to lead a successful and empowered and an accomplished life if you are giving yourself excuses. It can't happen. You need to keep momentum. 
You need to keep moving. It is a sink or swim situation. Either you swim or either you sink because the third option of standing on water cannot apply. This is principle number one. Put an end to excuses. No more blaming your circumstance. No more blaming the inactive masjid. No more blaming the streets. No more blaming social media. No more blaming your family. Put an end to excuses. This is rule number one. Those of intelligence, and you are amongst them, insha'Allah, they realize that excuses are walls that weak people hide behind. It is a temporary painkiller that they take in order to mask an internal pain, to convince others, and worse still, to convince themselves why they aren't doing anything with their lives as Muslims. And worse than this, excuses is, are, are tools that were used by some of the worst of creation. They are the hypocrites. The hypocrites of Medina used excuses to get themselves out of difficult situations and to participate with the Muslims. You remember when the coalition arrived at the city of Medina, 10,000 of them. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through recommendation from Salman decided to dig a trench in the northwest entrance to the city of Medina to prevent them from entering. And so all of the Muslims needed to participate in the digging of the trench and it was a life and death situation. People were afraid. There was, however, a third column, a fifth column of people. They were the hypocrites and they refused to participate. They said, our homes are vulnerable. We can't be here digging a trench. We've got to go home and be with our wives and children. Our homes are exposed. But Allah exposed them. And he told the Muslims that these were just excuses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمُ النَّبِي A group of them, meaning the hypocrites. They gave, they sought permission from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to leave. They said, our homes are vulnerable. Allah said, But their homes were not vulnerable. They just wanted to flee. They just wanted to escape. It was an excuse. That, by the way, is the textbook definition of what an excuse is. They say that an excuse, in its reality, is to shift the blame of an internal problem onto an external circumstance. That's an excuse, to shift the blame of an internal problem. We have an issue here. You feel that you have an issue here. You're not confident. You can't do it. I'm not ready. I am scared. I don't have the talents. It's not me. It's not my society. I'm not used to it. To shift the blame of an internal problem onto an external circumstance, it's their fault. But realize this is a slippery slope. And so if you find yourself, my dear brother, my dear sister, always explaining away why you couldn't do something, shouldn't do something, wouldn't do something, hadn't done something, then realize you are upon a slippery slope of failure. So pack your bags and leave. The giving of excuses and justification and now take with me principle number two. What was principle number one? Put an end to excuses. Principle number two. What you do today is an illustration of who you shall be tomorrow. The same way that your marriage, it cannot survive on the love of yesterday, your business, it cannot thrive on the profits of yesterday. The same thing can be said about you, Ya Akhil Kareem. You cannot be a successful Muslim of growth if you are just singing about the righteous person you used to be once upon a time in the past. There has to be activity today. The person you are going to be in the future if you are interested to know who he or she is and what they look like, I say to you, there is no magic needed, no horoscopes, no palm reading, and certainly no reading into the stars 
or a crystal ball. All you need to do is look into the decisions you are making today because that will be the person you shall be tomorrow. The intelligent person realizes that every unit of sacrifice and pain and planning and going out of your comfort zone will translate into a proportional unit of happiness and well-being and contentment and bliss in the future. It's a proportional exchange. And similarly, the opposite is true. Every unit of laziness, every unit of procrastination, delay, every unit of excuses, every unit of time that is wasted will translate into a proportional unit of regret and sadness and pain. What you do today is a very accurate depiction of who you shall be tomorrow. Every one of us is highly interested to know what he or she will look like in 10 years' time. Have you not asked yourself this question? I wonder what my business will be saying in 10 years' time. And I wonder how practicing I will be in 20 years' time. And what project I would have set up in 15 years' time. It's not a complicated question. And the answer is within reach. The same way that the decision you took yesterday has become now the reality of your today. صح? You made a decision yesterday to come to the masjid. And so today it's become a reality. You are in the masjid. Similarly, the decision you make today will become the reality of tomorrow. So create a vision. What does your future look like? It looks like the decisions you are making today. What are they? What is principle number one? Put an end to excuses. Principle number two? Huh? What is it? Your future will look like the decisions you're making today. Principle number three. Take note, ya shabab. Aim high because the lower levels are congested with people. Thomas Edison, you've heard of this name, right? We've all covered Thomas Edison during our GCSC education. The famous uh, inventor of the incandescent bulb and the first motion uh, camera. Thomas Edison, the greatest inventor of his era. Thomas Edison, he narrates an amazing story when he was still a child. He comes home on one evening after school and he hands his mother over a small letter that had been folded and they told him, don't read it, your mother will read it out to you. And so she opens the letter, her name is Alva, mother of Thomas Edison, and she says to him, after reading the content herself and weeping, Mom, what does it say? She said, the letter says that your son is a genius, and this school doesn't have the facility and the talents needed to educate a boy of this caliber, so please take him out of the school and educate him yourself. So she took the responsibility upon herself and she gave him homeschooling and he became Thomas Edison, the genius of his century. And then many years passed by and Thomas Edison passed away. Uh, and his mother, I mean to say Alva, passed away. And on one particular day when he was rummaging through his old family belongings, he opened up a desk and he found a small paper that was folded at the back of the drawer and he took it out and he opened it and what did it say? It said, your son is mentally ill. He has no future. Take him out in the school. He's not welcome here. So when he read this, he understood what happened and he wept for several hours and when he had managed to gather his thoughts, he pulled his diary and he wrote within it, Thomas Alva Edison was a mentally ill child, but by the efforts of a hero mother became the genius of his century. Aim high. That's what his mother, she did. Aim high because what? The lower levels are congested with people. 
survey results suggest that the majority of people have not set for themselves any goals in their lives. Are you part of this statistic? They say 80% of a population have not set for themselves any goals. It's just 20% who have goals. And of those 20% of people who have clearly identifiable goals that they are working towards, from that 20%, 70% of them fail to achieve it. See, brothers, sisters, the issue is not that we aim high and miss. The issue is that we aim low and we hit that target. The issue is that most of us aim at nothing in our lives and we hit that target with amazing accuracy. We receive nothing in the end. What is your target? Aim high. As a Muslim, you have every reason to aim high when you know that this life is not the end, but death is just the beginning. Thus, our Prophet ﷺ would say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يُحِبُّ مَعَالِيَ الْأُمُورِ وَأَشْرَافَهَا وَيَكْرَهُ سَبْسَافَهَا Allah loves the high matters, the lofty matters, the noble matters, and Allah hates the lowly, petty matters. Aim high because the lower levels are congested with people. Emerge from that deck and go to the upper deck, the people of high aspiration. And when you set yourself a goal, make sure it has two ingredients. They say, the scholars of leadership studies, they say this is what will bring optimum performance in the life of a person, and this is the ingredient of a giant. Two qualities for your goal that you set. Number one, clearly identifiable. It's clear. Not, not vague. Something that is clear. And number two, make it ambitious. They call it a stretch goal. Something that will stretch you. Like an elastic band, when you stretch it and you let go, it's not the same length. It is longer. That's the human, human being when he gives himself a goal that requires him to be stretched. When he comes out of the other side of that goal, he is, a, he is a stronger person. He is a bigger person. A goal that is clear and a goal that is what? Ambitious. And I love here the words of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah who said, Inna li nafsan tawaqa. I have a restless soul by my nature. He said, my soul is restless. مَا حَقَّقْتُ شَيْئًا فِي حَيَاتِي إِلَّا تَاقَتْ لَلَّذِي بَعْدَهُ Every time I achieve something in my life, I find my soul yearning for what is above it. And then he gives examples. He said, I set myself a goal of marrying my cousin Fatima bint Abdul, Abdul Malik, and I married her. Then I set myself a, a higher target of reaching a position of political authority. And I, I achieved it. And then I set myself a higher target of becoming the greatest political authority of the Muslims, the Khalifa. And he became the Khalifa. And he said, as for now, my soul is yearning for Jannah. Allahu Akbar. And I hope Allah will make me amongst his people. So aim high because the lower levels are, are congested. What was principle number one? We're going to keep repeating them. Huh? Put an end to Excuses. Principle number two. That's it. Yeah. Your future will look like the picture you're painting it today. Number three. Aim high because lower levels are congested. Principle number four. Most people search for what is easy. The giants, however, they search for a challenge. An Arab Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he pledged allegiance to him and he took his shahada and became a Muslim. And then, a few days or weeks later, the booty of war was distributed between the Muslims and they came to this Bedouin and they said, this is your booty. He said, what is this? They said, this is your portion of the booty of war. He didn't like this. So he carried all of it and he brought it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, what is this? He said, this is your portion of the booty of war. He said, ma ala hadha tabatuk. I didn't become a Muslim in search for this. Money, dunya. I didn't become a Muslim in search for this. 
ولكني اتبعتك على أن أرمى بسهم ها هنا وأشار إلى حلقه فأموت وأدخل الجنة But why I followed you was in the hope of receiving an arrow here in my throat causing me to die and thus Allah will allow me to enter Jannah Amazing aspirations This is what he wanted Shahada martyrdom So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him In tasduqillaha yasduqa if you are true to Allah, Allah will be true to you. If this is your intention and it is pure, Allah will help you fulfill it. Not long after this, the Muslims found themselves in the heart of a battle. And when the dust had settled, they began to search for who was dead and who was alive. And they found this man on his back. He had become a corpse with an arrow coming out of his neck. They called the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, Messenger of Allah, look at this. And so he went to his knees and he said, Ahu, ahu, is it the same one? Is it him? They said, yes, it's him. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wept. And he said, Sadaq Allah fa sadaqahu. He was true to Allah. So Allah was true to him. And then he carried him. And our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a strong man, the finest of men in terms of his physical construct and in terms of his akhlaq. He carried him, a man, on his forearms and he lifted him. And they shrouded him. And they prayed the pr prayer of janazah upon him. And they heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making a dua to Allah for this righteous man saying, Allahumma inna hadha abduk kharaja muhajiran fi sabilik faqutila shaheedan ana shaheedun alayhi. He said, oh Allah, this servant of yours, he migrated to Medina in search for your pleasure. And he was killed as a martyr in your path. I am a witness for him, oh Allah. I witness for him, oh Allah. Most people search for what is easy. The greats, they search for a challenge. And this is the attribute I hope you will define yourself with, dear brother, dear sister. Whatever that challenge may look like in your personal life, in search for the pleasure of Allah, and each one of us has his personal challenge and has his personal, personal obstacle he or she wants to overcome. Comfort is easy but now the modern day trend in the western thought is what the importance of moving out of your comfort zone this is the principle we are speaking about most people search for what is easy the greats they search for a challenge they don't live in this horrible dark zone called the comfort zone they are always on the other side of it because they realize that every good in this dunya and success in the hereafter is available but it's on the other side of the comfort zone there was a man called Bill Ekstrom, and he is the co-author of a book called The Coaching Effect. And he studied over 100,000 coaching interactions between coach and coachee, mentor and mentee, teacher and student, to try to understand what is it that brings success and, and growth in people. And after this long study, he concluded the following. What did he say? He said that growth cannot happen only in a state of discomfort. And then he says, your success in large is determined by your willingness and your comfort in making yourself uncomfortable. Then others, they took this theory and they made what they called the comfort zone framework. Have you heard of it? You've seen maybe that diagram of circles going out and then there's a label in each. It's an amazing diagram. This framework suggests that for you to grow as a human being, you need to go through three distinct stages at least. What are those three stages? And you will see subhanAllah how it links to Ramadan actually and fasting. But our life as Muslims, generally speaking, there is hardship. The first of these zones is called the comfort zone. Most of humanity live and die within this zone, comfort zone. It's a great place to be. Why? Because it's a place of familiarity. When you're within your comfort zone, 
you're with your family, you're with your close circle of friends, you're not challenging yourself to be somewhere or to do something that's outside of your custom, you're comfortable because you can control the factors. There's no surprises. You're not being mentally strained. You're not being physically challenged. You're on autopilot, like driving, like watching TV. This is called the comfort zone. And here your brain will produce happy chemicals like serotonin and dopamine. It keeps you buzzing. There's nothing scary to expect. So the comfort zone is a great place to be, but the only problem within it is that nothing ever grows in that zone. Things only deteriorate. And there was a study that was conducted on 2,000 participants. And the results were amazing. The results suggest that over half of Brits, 55% to be specific, are stuck in a day-to-day -day routine with nothing different. Their yesterday is a mirror reflection of today, and their today is a mirror reflection of tomorrow. Day-to-day, -to -day. that's over half of the population. And just under a third of the population, 31% to be specific, can't even remember the last time they did something uncomfortable or challenge themselves to walk out of their comfort zone. That is, the, that is the comfort zone. So the moment you choose to sleep, instead of going for a run, for example, or going to the gym, you have chosen comfort. Temporary, immediate comfort, but not for long, because discomfort will catch up with you soon or later. The moment you press your snooze button on your phone, to delay Salatul Fajr, and you're praying at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, when the sun is fully risen, you've chosen comfort, but not for long, because if Tawbah is not met, there will be discomfort eventually that will catch up. A sister of ours who's maybe struggling with her hijab, either she's not wearing it, or it's a hijab that she knows is not really a hijab, she has chosen comfort. But not for long, because discomfort will follow if this isn't changed. You know someone who left employment, a perfectly legit source of income, although it's maybe minimum wage. Or someone who left study. Why? Because they want comfort. They will tell you, that was only temporary. Now we are weeping the tears of bitter regret. We're very uncomfortable now because of those decisions. And let me tell you another problem with this comfort zone. Remember, which heading are we speaking about here? Which principle? Number four, correct. What is it titled? Most people search for, easy. Most people search for what is easy? And the, and the giant search for a challenge. And we're talking about zone number one, the comfort zone. One last thing about this zone before I share with you zone number two, on your way to growth. The other issue with the comfort zone, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, uh, is that it doesn't stay the same size. It shrinks and gets smaller. And the more you stay inside of your comfort zone and you don't challenge yourself to grow as a Muslim, your comfort zone actually gets smaller. The walls begin to close in on you. What does that look like? Say, for example, you're only comfortable hanging out with 10 people, 10 brothers. You don't like to hang out with anybody else. If you stay like that, <laughs> it gets smaller, your comfort zone. So now you're only comfortable with eight of them. And a few years later, it's just five of them. And the next thing you know, you're a complete loner. You're cut off. No one wants to talk to you. You don't want to talk to anyone else. The comfort zone doesn't, get, doesn't stay the same size. It gets smaller. You only go to the masjid once a week, right? For example, only once a week. Because you're comfortable with that. Anything more is uncomfortable. Fine, but that's going to get smaller. And even going to the masjid once a week, becomes a little bit difficult now when you're trying to find your way out of that obligation. But the opposite is true. When you find new challenges as a Muslim, new challenges of growth, you meet new people, you plan for your religion, you learn something new, you're uncomfortable. Guess what? The borders of the comfort zone grow to meet you, to catch up with you. Till what was uncomfortable yesterday becomes natural today. Keep doing it. What is natural today becomes comfortable tomorrow. It also grows. Don't live within the comfort zone. The comfort zone, therefore, is your worst enemy. Pack your luggage and come into the second zone now. What is the second zone on your way to growth? It's called the, does anyone know? 
Yeah, the fear zone. You've now managed to convince yourself to do something with your life. To learn a new craft, to learn a new trade, to improve your tajweed, to change your dress, to reshuffle your... You come into now the, huh? the fear zone. All of a sudden, you, you can't control the variables here. There's things that will challenge you physically, challenge you mentally. And your brain, therefore, starts blocking those happy chemicals of serotonin and dopamine. And instead, it starts producing stress-related hormones like adrenaline and glutamate. You're now afraid. You're distressed. You're anxious. So most people, what do they do? They quickly scurry back into the comfort zone. Every time they, kind of walk, they want to walk out, they say, it's time now. I'm not a kid anymore. You come to walk out, this huge inner debate ensues inside of you. And you start hearing things like, I can't. No, I won't. It's, it's impossible. I, I don't have the talent. And what will people say? No, I'm not used to it. it. It's not me. You're just getting all these error messages cropping up in your mind. But the good news is, alhamdulillah, here's some reassurance for you, brother, sister, is that if you are patient, this fear zone, as we just said, doesn't stay forever. Uh, you find your feet. It becomes natural to be there. Actually, it becomes comfortable. The borders have grown. Now you're coming into the third zone. What is this zone called? The growth zone. So khalas, you finished now with the comfort zone. You moved out into the fear zone. You were patient. You didn't throw in the towel when you got scared or bored. And now you are into the growth zone. That's where the Muslim wants to be. Success is bred there. Growth is bred there. Happiness, well-being is bred there. For those who are looking for a happiness, we will speak about this next week. It's found within the, within the growth zone. And one bit of advice to keep you there, my brother, my sister. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep reading. Minimize TV. Wallah, minimize Netflix. Junk food is not what you consume through your mouth, it's what you consume through your eyes and ears. That is the worst form of junk we're allowing into our system. Keep learning. Read, even if you don't like it. Even if it makes you uncomfortable. We said we've got to get out of that zone. If you have to watch, watch something useful that will help you grow. Add to your information and knowledge. Attend a halaqa like this. A weekly halaqa outside of Ramadan. Watch a beneficial YouTube lecture. Learn a new language. Learn a new craft. Learn a new trade. Keep learning. This is a salient characteristic of the giants. So you have the comfort zone, then you have the fear zone, then you have the, the growth zone. And here's what is interesting. You have two decks of people. You have a lower deck. May Allah protect us from these people. They are the people who live in comfort and laziness, and no objectives, low aspirations. That's the lower deck. And then you have a deck above them they're, they are the people who live in discomfort, but they are accomplished, they are growing, they are fulfilled. And subhanallah, both of these people, of these decks, they are both mocking each other. They both wonder at why you are there, you should join us. So listen to the conversation between them. The lower deck, the people of comfort and low ambitions, they look at the deck above them and they say, what are you guys doing there? I mean, haven't you seen how comfortable our couches are? We have Netflix stream. We've got food and snack at, at our fingertips. We have Uber Eats. We've got Deliveroo. Join us. What are you doing there? We sleep long hours. And our minds, they never ache. Our bodies, they never sweat. Our muscles, they never ache. Join us. This is the life. And for them, it's inconceivable that there could be a life better than theirs. Comfort. There's your drink, there's your snack, there's your TV, there's your phone, and there's your back massager. It's all there. But the guys on the upper deck, the people of discomfort, but high ambitions and growth, they look down at the lower deck and they say, what are you talking about? You want us to join you? Hold on a minute. Show us your arteries, please. Show us your veins. Show us your cholesterol levels. Show us your blood pressure levels. Show us the ever-shrinking brain cells that you have and your ever-shrinking muscles in your body. Show us your iman that is only getting weak weaker and your knowledge that is getting looser. Show us. You want us to join you? No, you should join us. 
Come see now the deck of ambition, the deck of growth, the deck of accomplishment. Come and join us. This is life here. We are the happy ones. Show us your recitation of the Quran. It hasn't grown. Your tajweed, it hasn't grown. Your circle of Muslim friends, they haven't grown. Your love of Allah, your iman, none of it has grown. You're the same person I met 10 years ago, if not worse. We are the people of ambition and happiness. Come join us here. And after all, your discomfort, your comfort, that's temporary. Discomfort will catch up with you. And our discomfort, that's temporary. And comfort will catch up with us very soon. So make a plan to come out of your comfort zone. Most people, they search for what is easy. But the giants, they search for a challenge. So make a plan to come out of the comfort zone. Make the phone calls. Make those connections with those righteous brothers and sisters. Uh, if it's a sin that apparently gives you peace and comfort, it's giving you comfort. Make your plan to come out of that comfort. A certain hijab that you are abusing, it's giving you comfort. Make a plan out of that comfort. A business transaction that's bringing you high returns, but you know it's a shady business deal. Make a plan to come out of that comfort. And remember, as we said, a, a ship enjoys being on the shore because it's safe there. But that's not what the ship was made for. The ship was mailed, made to sail in the sea and to battle with the waves. And success and failure have a cost, by the way. We are constantly told that success, you want to be successful, you've got to pay the price. It's not just success that has a price, Habibi. Failure has a price as well. The only difference between the two is that the price of failure is far higher than the price of success. So you choose which of the two you want to pay. What are the four principles so far? We're going to conclude now quickly with the fifth. Number one. Yalla ya Sami. Number one. Put an end to excuses. Number two. Yalla ya Pamir. Huh? Yeah, what you do today is an illustration of who you shall be tomorrow. Number three. Yeah. Yalla, someone help out our young brother. Aim high because the lower levels are congested. Aim high. Yes, correct. Number four. Most people search for what is easy. The giants search for a challenge. Please value these principles, yeah, brothers, yeah, sisters. The fifth one is never say that you have missed the opportunity. And never say it's too late. As cliche as that may sound, if we are able to summarize life with one word, that word would probably be continue. Plow on. Keep going. Never say that you have missed the boat because as long as your eyes are yet to fall on the face of the angel of death, realize it's still a free for all. Look here, for example, the likes of Henry Ford. When he invented his revolutionary uh, uh, Model T car in 1908, he was 45 years old. He wasn't at his prime at all. 45. Joe Biden. President of the United States. How old was he when he became president? 78 years old. Margaret Ford here in the UK, her debut as an author, her first book that she wrote, she was 94 years old. Never say that you've missed the opportunity. Then you look into our own tradition as Muslims. Allahu Akbar. As Siddiq Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu becomes the eminent, most eminent and scholarly figure in our Muslim heritage after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he is first place and he only started at the age of 40 it was around that age when he became a Muslim and then you have the likes of Imam Ibn al-Jawzi Abu al-Faraj he mastered the 10 modes of recitation when he was 80 years old how can you say you've missed the opportunity and Imam al-Bukhari, he said, مَا تَعَلَّمَ صَحَابَةُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِلَّا كِبَارًا The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, only learned their religion when they were older. They were moving, they were getting on. They were older when they started learning their religion. 
The shabab at that time weren't that many. And then look at our scholars like Imam Ibn Hazm, Imam Ibn al-Arabi, al-Maliki, Fudayl, Ibn Ayyad, and others. They became scholars of the religion later on in their lives. They weren't young when they started. Al-Azz ibn Abd salam same thing. And then you look at the political front and some of the things that were achieved in our history at old age. Yusuf ibn Tashafin, rahimahullah, who defeated one of the fiercest kings of Europe, the Castilian king, Alfonso VI. It was a devastating encounter a gruesome, bloody encounter between the Muslims led by Yusuf ibn Tashafin and this man, Alfonso VI, who had gathered an army of 100,000 men. And he said, with this army, I shall defeat the inhabitants of the heavens and the angels and the spirits and Muhammad and his men. I will crush them all. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. And they meet in this grueling encounter a battle that lasted nine hours and so much blood was shed from both sides that is that it was t titled does anyone know the name of the battle huh al azzalaqa azzalaqa it literally means the slippery plain because so much blood was spilt people were falling all over the place azzalaqa and alhamdulillah you'll be surprised to know that by the end of it from the 100,000 uh, combatants led by Alfonso VI, only 500 remained, including Alfonso himself, who retreated back to his empire with one leg missing. Why did I narrate this story to you? Because how old was Yusuf ibn Tashafin when he led this campaign? He was at the ripe old age of 80 years old, way past the contemporary man's retirement age. Look at what he was doing at the age of 80. So you say you've missed the opportunity. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. And realize whenever you get lazy, there is a bitter reality. And that reality states that there is a pain that you and I have to experience whether we like it or not. You choose which of the two, but there's no third option. You have to experience one or the other. The first pain is the pain of sacrifice and waking up early and vision setting and growth discomfort. Either you choose that pain or you have automatically chosen the other pain if you don't, and that is the pain of regret and sadness and misery for not being the best version of yourself as a believer. We ask Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to guide us to the best of those two decisions. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.